Um, my name is Steve Carstens, and I'm the editor-in-chief of Dental Sleep Practice Magazine, and I want to welcome you to our webinar. Today we have the honor of having Dr. Ben Moralia talk to us today about uh, getting, diagnosing and recognizing sleep problems and growth and development issues, things you can see in your practice to make a difference in your young people's health and, and even in adults. I want to tell you a little bit about Ben. He graduated from the State University of New York at Buffalo Dental Medicine and a member of OKU Dental Honor Society. He completed a general practice residency program at Danbury Hospital in Connecticut. His 20 years of private practice experience in Mount Kisco, New York, where his focus has been on early childhood growth and development. So he's an expert about this. He lectures nationally on childhood sleep disorder breathing and its impact on the development of the maxilla, mandible, and airway. He was recently honored with a position on the President's Council of Northern Westchester Hospital in Mount Kisco, New York. Dr. Moralia and his wife Lisa enjoy three beautiful children, Madison, Max, and Molly. And I know they're going to be growing up just fine. So I want to thank uh, Perfect Start for sponsoring this program. And I know we're going to be uh, entertained and educated very well by Dr. Ben Moralia. Thank you very much, Steve. Well, they're very kind words. It's a very generous introduction that you gave me. Uh, you read it just the way I wrote it. All right, so now without uh, further ado, I'm going to open up a PowerPoint presentation to share everything we're up to with you guys. And uh, this is uh, basically my favorite topic. It's what I enjoy doing most in dentistry. And recognizing, diagnosing, and treating jaw, sleep, and breathing disorders in young patients is what we're going to focus on over the next hour. And basically, Steve's already done a, a very nice introduction for me. Uh, the idea is that we're here for a single purpose, and it is for the overall growth, development, health, and longevity of our young patients. And so we see a lot of children in the practice. Uh, they're all rock stars in their own right. Uh, we do love seeing the kids, and most of them, like this little Molly, come in. Very happy to be there because uh, everything we're involved with as far as the uh, growth and development and uh, kind of guidance appliance systems that we're going to show you uh, are fun and pleasurable to do because there are no needles, there's no drilling, there's nothing that's associated with the uh, so-called discomforts of dentistry. This is all just basically playing with the kids uh, and getting them to wear soft and comfortable removable appliances that will alter or help them to get back on track for their normal growth and development. So while we see a lot of kids in the practice and we recognize that uh, some of them have uh, teeth that are not quite in the right place, uh, we do treat them like rock stars. We roll out the red carpet. We make it a Disney parade for them every time they come in. So we do have a slightly different perspective on how we look at the kids. Uh, you know, A long time ago when we started this, we were taking photographs of the teeth and more photographs of the teeth. And then after we took a lot of photographs of the teeth, we took more photographs of the teeth. What we learned was that there's a whole lot more going on uh, with the children than just what's happening in their mouths. And we started to step back a little bit and look at a, a bigger question. And we started asking ourselves, do we have a healthy child in front of us? Basically, from the moment we meet a child, now our first initial kind of uh, question we're asking ourselves, is that a healthy child? And if not, what could be going or, you know, what could be going on with that child? What might that child be struggling with? What might their family be struggling with? And we started taking more photographs of the children's faces. And we're asking ourselves, with each child we meet, is this a healthy child? And if we meet a little boy like Julian, and this is his face photo uh, at age six when we meet him, we start to recognize that maybe Julian isn't as healthy as he can be. When we meet a little boy like David at about eight and a half or nine years old, uh, we recognize again, you know, is David healthy? Is this as healthy as he can be? Is that a picture of a healthy David? Or is there something we could do maybe to improve that? A little girl like Emma, if we meet her at, say, age 11, and she comes in you know, looking like this. If this is her face photograph at age 11, is this the healthiest Emma that we could have? When a little boy like Michael comes in at about eight and a half years old, and this is his profile, and at the age of nine, when we meet him, and this is the profile photograph, Michael is not overweight, but yet this is the profile we see. You know, Do we start to think about whether or not he's as healthy as he can be? Julia, when we meet Julia at about age eight and a half, we start taking a look at the photograph and we realize maybe Julie is not as healthy as she could be. All of these children have kind of similar characteristics in their photographs and what you see on the outside, whether it's the face photo or the profile photo, tends to show up inside the mouth as well. And rather than starting with the teeth, we back up a little bit just to recognize that there may be more going on with the child than just some either crowding of the teeth or some sort of malocclusion they may have. There could be a little bigger picture. So we see a lot of children, uh, several hundred per year, that we get involved with our Perfect Start appliances. 
And we know that as we're lecturing around the country and we're teaching these cases to other dental offices and practices, we know that they see lots of children. And really, even in just daily public, walking around, going to airports, going to malls, going to schools, going to restaurants, there are children everywhere. And between our neighborhoods and our communities, I think we all recognize children that have or are struggling with some of these things that you're about to see. And sometimes it's the children struggling with these things. Sometimes it's the whole family struggling with these items. And not the least of which is the ADD, ADHD diagnosis. But along with that comes a long list of things, allergies, asthma, upper respiratory infections, ear infections, ear tubes, bedwetting, nightmares and night terrors, poor academic performance, speech issues, aggressive behavior, clenching and grinding of the teeth, restless sleep or waking often, small or delayed growth, pacifier use, anxiety, depression, daytime sleepiness, overweight, obesity, social misconduct, inappropriate behavior, night sweats, sensory issues, snoring, and not the least of which is mouth breathing. This is not an exhaustive list. This is really just the tip of the iceberg on some of the symptoms and or disorders or diseases or conditions mm -hmm. that some of the children and families are struggling with today. There is such a thing as normal growth and development. So to get ourselves on track, we want to take a look at and refresh our memory as to what normal growth and development looks like. And this is what we should be seeing when our three to five year olds show up. When we get a three to five year old come in the practice and they have that primary set of dentition, the primary set of dentition should come with a space between every single primary tooth. So that normally growing and developing three to five year old or normal growth and development for a primary set of teeth is to have a space between every tooth. Not to mention the fact that we should have <clears throat> a perfect overbite and overjet, meaning we should have a view or a display of the bottom teeth. We shouldn't have a deep bite, so to speak, where the bottom teeth would be hidden. This is a photograph of a five-year-old that came in. We took a picture because this happens very rarely. In seeing several hundred children a year, it's only a few children every year that show up in the age group of three to five that have a space between every single primary tooth and an appropriate overbite and over jet. When this child opens up wide, we have a broad wide arch. All of the teeth are spaced. Every single tooth has room between it and the next one. That's normal growth and development. This is a primary seed set of teeth that's set up very nicely so that that child could kind of grow into the permanent set of teeth. When that five-year-old turns into a 12-year-old without any intervention, this is that one child in however many you might call it, but we think it's one in a hundred really that shows up and just goes from their primary teeth to their permanent teeth and has them all in perfect placement. Well, we have a broad wide arch. We can see all of the teeth are fairly well aligned. This is a child that has not had any orthodontic intervention, no appliances at any age, just had the opportunity to grow and develop normally. We get to say to that child, congratulations, you don't need to have a set of braces. You have you know, a good setup. All your teeth are right where they belong. And really what we notice in the upper arch is in that broad, wide palate, the shape and the position of the palate, it resembles an imprint of the tongue. And most importantly for our growth and development is to have the tongue in the roof of the mouth so we get that full shape and development of the palate based on the shape and size and imprint of the tongue. This child has what we label as that class one occlusion. And that's the canine to molar <coughs> positioning that represents all of the intercuspation that classifies itself as that class one bite. It comes with a broad, wide smile. Obviously, the teeth have a reasonable overbite and overjet. This child is in good position without having any orthodontics and really requires minimal to no attention. There's no need for orthodontics here. This is a very functional and stable and comfortable and aesthetically pleasing occlusion. So the child wouldn't need any more. But when we do have these credentials in a child where there's broad, wide arch development, the palate is shaped like the imprint of the tongue, the overbite and overjet are normal with some intercuspation, we expect to see some facial features that are associated with a full complement of teeth like this. So we get an excellent broad wide smile display. So this child has a full wide smile and a full display of teeth that fills up the mouth. And it's okay to have the teeth fill up the mouth and fill up the lip line and give us a full display of that smile without having had any orthodontics. The facial proportions are very nice, whether we're dividing into thirds from the facial or the profile, we can recognize that this child has excellent facial proportions, everything is cosmetically appealing, and we have everything pretty much right where we need it to be 
And that's a child that had a chance to grow and develop normally and did not require orthodontic treatment to get there. So that normally growing and developing five-year-old, since we see and photograph a lot of children between the ages of three and five and watch how their teeth come in and how their bites develop, this type of photograph only shows up a few times in every several hundred children. So I like to refer to that child as an endangered species because we don't see that very much. Every year I look for a child like that to photograph uh, and have that bite show up with the space between all of those primary teeth, a child that has the opportunity to grow into their permanent teeth perfectly without orthodontic care, and that's incredibly rare. For me, it's maybe one out of 100 kids show up like that. Okay, so all about growth, right? Well, normal growth, we're looking for wide, we're looking for forward, and we're looking for downward. If we get wide and forward and downward, that gives us the opportunity to have all of the development of the maxilla and the mandible produce a space for every tooth, and not only does every tooth fit in, but they form themselves into a beautiful bite with a broad, wide arch, a beautiful display of teeth, an occlusion that's acceptable, so we'll have a, a very nice uh, class one type of intercuspation. A nice overbite overjet means there's a full display of the bottom teeth on a smile. And then there's also the abnormal growth, which is when we're not growing wide, obviously we're narrow. If we're not coming forward, we're backward. Downward can be part of the abnormal growth. And it is referred to as the excess facial height malocclusion. And we're going to get to the downward growth and development as being uh, abnormal when it's alone, meaning without wide and forward, downward alone is an abnormal growth and development situation where malocclusion exists. But most of our abnormal growth is an underdevelopment, meaning if we're not wide, we're narrow. Well, that'll produce crowding and malocclusion. And if we don't come forward, if we stay backward in our development, we certainly don't have enough room for the teeth. So underdevelopment is going to be our focus. We see bites like this. This is very common to see a set of primary teeth that has little to no space and sometimes overlap of the primary teeth and a deep bite where we don't really see the lower teeth. So when the lower teeth are not in display, we call it a deep bite. This child has a deep bite. The deep bites usually come with a little overjet as well. And whether it's a mild or moderate or severe uh, form of overjet, we'll get into the introduction of the class two occlusion shortly, but the idea here is this child is off in the wrong direction. And where they're, while they're about six years old, they're well on course towards having a malocclusion, and it's not going to self-correct. We see a lot of this. When we look into the palate, we see a lot of V-shaped arches. And so when we're looking at that V-shaped arch, that inverted V that we see on the screen, the high vault, and a palatal shape and design that does not reflect an imprint of the tongue. This patient's tongue is not shaped or sized like this. Whereas the previous patient, we saw a beautiful broad wide dome and the tongue was an imprint of the palate, or the palate is an imprint of the tongue, I should say. So here we have this kind of V-shaped high vaulted arch. And you know this has to come from some reason. There has to be a reason how that child got there. We see a lot of overjet, plenty of overjet. Plenty of children come in with an overjet that is excessive and unacceptable. Part of the problem with an overjet is this child has a difficult time getting lip seal at rest. When they close their mouth, sometimes the lower lip is actually resting right on the incisal edges here. <clears throat> so what happens for that child is even trying to breathe through the nose at rest is difficult for them because their lower lip rests against the incisal edges of the upper teeth. So the next question, obviously, that we're getting at is why? Why are the maxilla and the mandible underdeveloped? Because if we're getting malocclusions and crowding and all these poor bites because the maxilla and mandible have not developed their width and have not developed a forward position and have not developed a full to downward position, well, we want to know why. And something prevented that from happening. There has to be a reason why the maxilla and the mandible did not develop to their full potential. What caused that is the question we'll be asking next. Why are the maxilla and the mandible underdeveloped? That answer we look to anthropology research. And in one in particular, we'll focus on is Dr. Robert Corcini. Now, Dr. Robert Corcini was not only an anthropologist, but he was a specialist in head and neck anthropology. <clears throat> and more specific than that, he was a malocclusion specialist. In other words, Dr. Corcini, most of his career was spent on the anthropology, the study of malocclusions causes. There are hundreds of people that have been involved in all of this research and development, but for our time purposes, we'll focus on kind of the, I would say, the godfather of the malocclusions causes. That's a picture of the good Dr. Robert Corcini. Well, he wrote the book. His book was the culmination of decades of research, and the title says it all, How Anthropology Informs the Orthodontic Diagnosis of Malocclusions Causes. How Anthropology Informs 
the orthodontic diagnosis of malocclusion's causes. Well, Dr. Corgini spent decades researching malocclusion all throughout the world, and what he learned over all the decades of research that he did was that prior to 400 years ago, there's little to no evidence of malocclusion in the human race. So prior to 400 years ago, the human beings do not exhibit malocclusion at any significant rate. In fact, it's very little to none. All 32 teeth are present in the skull. There's a broad, wide arch. And the palate is wide and broad and shaped like an imprint of the tongue. So this is what we would expect to see on human beings prior to about 350 and 400 years ago. Broad, wide, full facial development with a full complement of teeth in a beautiful occlusion. And every tooth fits. But what happens when Dr. Cortini travels the world and studies isolated rural peoples is that he discovers that there is a ubiquity of breastfeeding, meaning all the babies are breastfed because it's the only form of nourishment, but it is followed, interestingly, by a hard diet. And as he studies these people, he learns that as they're eating, their diet being raw and being uh, lacking or of the refining process or the preserving process or the preparing process, basically the meats are cured. And a cured meat is like a beef jerky. So it becomes a harder diet, a diet that you have to use muscles to actually eat and use, to chew and digest the food. And what he notices with this beginning of life being a breastfed diet followed by a hard diet is that there's little to no incidence of malocclusion or other inflammatory or degenerative diseases. There's little to no variation amongst these populations. And he also studied these populations as they became exposed to Western cultures. We're going, to re we're going to revisit that point in a moment once we cover a couple other details. But there's a significant and startling change with populations and cultures as they fade from breastfeeding and fade from a hard diet into the bottles, the pacifiers, and the softer diets. And it all is it's all reflected in what happens to the children. The animal studies that are conducted, not only by Dr. Corcini, but in the anthropology world, are very simple. They've been done for decades, and basically it's the hard, soft diet study. These are staples in the anthropology community. When you feed an animal a hard diet and you feed another animal a soft diet, they will grow and develop differently. The soft diet animals will have smaller body mass, and the rest of the list is in the dental world. They will have a narrower maxilla, a smaller mandible, a thinner alveolus, which is the rim of bone that holds the teeth in, smaller condyles, which is the extension of the mandible that connects the temporal bone, less dense bone, smaller, weaker oral musculature. So what happens here is, as soon as you feed an animal an early soft diet, they will have a narrower maxilla, a smaller mandible, smaller condyles, and weaker oral musculature. When isolation is broken, what happens to a population when a generation starts to trade? Meaning, trade occurs with an industrialized or a westernized nation, or advancements in refining and preparing and processing food. It typically shows up in the first generation at a particular rate. And as Dr. Porcini studies the broken isolation of populations, he recognizes one of the earliest things that happens is food is traded. And when we trade food, we're trading the refining process and preserved product for the natural. And what happens then is, as the children are fed the softer diet, the malocclusion rate shows up at about 50% in the first generation. So the malocclusion rates have a rapid rise up to 50% in one generation, which is about 25 to 30 years. Now, the malocclusion rates rise dramatically into the second generation, and that can reach levels of 70%. And a third generation can reach about 85 because what happens is, as more and more trade happens, as a society becomes more westernized or more industrialized, there's a more ubiquitous use of soft food. So the soft food becomes not just one meal a day, but all of the meals per day. As the hard diet decreases and the soft diet increases, the malocclusion rate rises dramatically. And really, by the time you're 90 to 100 years in, which is a three-generation to four-generation span, malocclusion rates will be somewhere between 85 and 90 percent. American children today are in the category of an early soft diet, and that early soft diet for the first year to two years of life produces the malocclusion rate at about 85 to 90 percent of children will have teeth and a bite that are less than acceptable. So Dr. Cortini's conclusion of all his research is summarized in a, a long sentence. Dietary consistency and toughness promote proper bone growth and proper permanent tooth eruption, bringing about ideal occlusion. When non-resistant processed foods become ubiquitous after industrialization 
and the eruption and cuspal coordination of teeth lose the critical pathfinder influence of vigorous masticatory pressures, malocclusion shows a rapid rise. The first sentence is important. Dietary consistency and toughness promote proper bone growth and proper permanent tooth eruption. That basically is a summary of bone dynamics, how the body works. Bone yields the muscle. When the diet is tough and the muscles have to work, when the muscles have to work, it promotes bone growth. When the bone grows, we get a bigger maxilla and a bigger mandible. The hard diet is important to have a mandible and a maxilla that are full size. The soft diet doesn't give a child a chance to have a full size maxilla and mandible. So the conclusions, it's all summarized as breastfeeding results in proper training and development of the tongue. Breastfeeding will result in a strengthening of the tongue, but also in the training of the tongue to really hit the palate or the roof of the mouth. In order to breastfeed properly, the tongue has to raise or go up into the palate and press, and that's what promotes the maxilla growth. The early hard diet continues the process. Once the tongue is trained to hit the palate and rise, the child's tongue goes up and back, up and back, up and back. A tongue that constantly hits the palate to swallow is properly functioning, and proper bone growth comes of that. But a child that has less breastfeeding and a softer diet following it, the tongue learns to go forward and backward, forward and backward, not up and down. And bottles and pacifiers and soft food promote a motion of the tongue that is front to back rather than up and down. And that tongue thrusting habit really keeps the tongue off of the palate. And then the palate can't grow as much as it can when the tongue is in it. And when the tongue postures or rests, swallows, and speaks properly, we get ideal growth. But it has to be using musculature, and a hard diet is required to get there. Prepared, processed, and preserved foods are too soft to contribute to proper development. And really, the summary is that most malocclusions are acquired, not inherited. Anthropologists around the world have studied this for decades, and the conclusions are always very similar that most malocclusions are acquired, they are not inherited. Malocclusion is a disease of Western or industrialized societies. The more a country becomes westernized or industrialized, the malocclusion rates will rise. The next question, what are the consequences of having an underdeveloped maxilla and mandible? Now that we know in a Western industrialized society we'll have high rates of malocclusion and crowding because the maxilla and mandible haven't grown to their full size or full potential, what are the consequences of having that underdeveloped maxilla and mandible? Is crowded teeth and a malocclusion the real problem? Are crowded teeth and a poor bite really what the children are struggling with? We need to look at our anatomy for more answers. If we remember our maxilla, our maxilla not only holds the top teeth in place, but the maxilla also makes up the floor of the nasal cavity and the lateral wall of the nasal cavity, this triangle. This triangle is where we draw our breath from, and the nose was built to breathe. Human beings are obligate nose breathers. The nose was built to filter, warm, humidify the air, basically to prepare the air for the lung so we could have an optimal functioning of the lung. Breathing through the mouth doesn't do that. The mouth doesn't filter, warm, or humidify the air. So being a human being, you're an obligate nose breather, you would like to have the best size chamber here to breathe through. As it turns out, a maxilla that doesn't develop its full width, a narrow maxilla, comes with a narrow nasal chamber. The narrower the maxilla is, the narrower this triangle is. If the maxilla develops full width, it opens up a wider triangle. So the children who come in with narrow V-shaped or high vaulted arches have smaller nasal chambers, and they're not able to be the nose breather we'd like them to be. So an underdeveloped maxilla comes with an, a compromise in the ability to breathe through the nose. When we look at our profile, a maxilla that doesn't have a chance to grow forward appropriately will produce a space back here that's known as the nasal pharynx and oropharynx that is narrower. So the colors here, the light green is the nasal pharynx, then there's this aqua color, the oropharynx, and the purple, the laryngeal pharynx. This is basically the airway. And since we already know the narrower maxilla will have a narrower nasal chamber, a maxilla that doesn't grow forward will have a narrower nasopharynx to oropharynx. And if the mandible doesn't grow to a larger size and the condyles are short from that early soft diet, the mandible may not grow forward enough, and that keeps the tongue in a posterior position. When the mandible doesn't grow forward enough, the tongue in a posterior position closes off or compromises the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx. So basically what happens is, that early soft diet gives us a compromised airway or a smaller airway. So altering the normal growth and development of the maxilla and the mandible, which is holding the tongue, will have an effect on the size of a child's airway or their ability to breathe through their nose. 
So we take a look at two 10-year-olds. We have a 10-year-old on the left side of the screen that has a class one occlusion, you know, a, basically a classic class one occlusion. The nostril is easily visible, and if the air were breathed in through the nostril, it would follow this tube and work its way all the way down into the lung. And that's a very nice tube. This child has a large tube to breathe through. When we look at the child on the right side of the screen, they do have a classic class one occlusion, okay? a characteristic occlusion of the cusps of the teeth falling into what's called the class one occlusion. But from the nostril, when we look at the airway, it gets a little bit narrower here. And then it widens again by the trachea. But the idea here is this child has a compromised airway. So while they both have a class one bite, one of them has a bite that grew forward and opened up the space here for them to breathe. The other child, their bite didn't grow forward. Their maxilla did not grow forward. Their maxilla didn't grow wide. Their mandible hasn't grown forward. And by having a retruded position, leaves them with a narrow airway. Let's compare the faces. These are the same two children. One of them is growing forward. And with the forward growth, the eyes, the nose, the lips, they're all in position to resemble Norman normal, normal human growth and development. And normal human growth and development is wider and forward and a little downward. And this, these are the characteristics of a normal human being. And a long jawline gives them the ability to get that air into their lung. And they have a broad, wide tube, like we saw in the previous picture. But a child that does not grow wide, does not grow forward, does, and only stays backwards, basically has no forward growth and development. The lower third is missing. The middle third is small. The lower third is excessively small. And that lack of forward growth produces a big compromise in that airway, and that child has a difficult time breathing through their nose. Nasal breathing and mouth breathing, these are two different worlds. There's a big difference between nasal breathing and mouth breathing. Mouth breathing is completely unhealthy for a human being. Nasal breathing, the nose was built to filter, warm, and humidify the air to basically prepare it for the lung. And there's been a lot of research done to show that there is a difference between nasal breathing and mouth breathing for human beings. We start with Dr. Harvold, and a long time ago, Dr. Harvold was working at the Center for Craniofacial Anomalies, and he did a lot of research on primates, and what he would do with these monkeys, block the nasal chamber. Basically, he would plug the noses with cotton, just to see how they would grow and develop. And young monkeys, when the noses are plugged with cotton rolls, all of a sudden, he's conducting airway studies, but what he's recognizing is that nasal obstruction produces the mouth breathing, which lowers the tongue posture, and the end result is that the monkeys develop a malocclusion, a, mal a malocclusion characterized by narrowness, lack of forward growth, and downward growth. And it changes their entire facial appearance. Dr. Sten Linder Aronson conducted these studies with children. The only difference is it's, it's really not good form to plug the nose of kids to do research. So what happens was he would take groups of children to first diagnose you know, which were the nose breathers and which were the mouth breathers. So I'm pretty sure the exhaustive study that had to go into that was uh, time consuming. But at the end, what he did was determining children who were nasal breathers were in one category and children who were mouth breathers in another category. The same results, though. The mouth breathers develop differently. The mouth breathers are the children that have, have their poor tongue position and function. And combine the mouth breathing plus the poor tongue position and function show up with higher rates of malocclusion. And again, similar characteristics. Narrower, a lack of forward growth and possibly only downward growth, the excess facial height malocclusion. Now the compromised nasal airway. The early soft diet leads to an underdeveloped maxilla and mandible. We learned from Dr. Porcini and other anthropologists that an early hard diet produces bone growth, in which case there is no malocclusion after that. The underdeveloped maxilla leads to a smaller nasal cavity and nasal pharynx. The retrognathic position of the underdeveloped mandible reduces the oropharynx. The result is mouth breathing. Once we have mouth breathing, that early soft diet combined with the mouth breathing, keep the tongue posture low. When the tongue posture stays low, the tongue does not live in the roof of the mouth. It does not produce an imprint in the roof of the mouth. And next thing we know, we are off to the races with mouth breathing. Mouth breathing will add another complicating factor to the children because breathing through the mouth will result in tonsil and adenoid inflammation or swollen or enlarged conditions that further reduce the airway. The tonsils and adenoids were not meant to get the air through the mouth or first, and that causes them to become inflamed or swollen or enlarged. When tonsils and adenoids get enlarged in mouth breathers, 
it further reduces the airway and now the child has a significant airway obstruction issue. It brings us to the granddaddy title of all of these which is the sleep disorder breathing group. Sleep disorder breathing was uh, really brought into the forefront of research in 2012 by Dr. Karen Bonnick. Dr. Karen Bonnick was examining the sleep disorder breathing symptom relationship to behavior. And, and what she did was take kids who had anything from mouth breathing to snoring to sleep apnea. The sleep disorder breathing is an umbrella title for all or anything other than normal nose breathing patterns while sleeping. And basically what she did was examine uh, the largest group of children, 11,000 children, over a course of about six years. The results of the study were uh, staggering because what she noticed was that there was a strong and persistent association between sleep disorder breathing and diminished IQ. The children in the sleep disorder breathing category had lower IQs as they were tested over the six years than the children who were not sleep disorder breathing children. The bigger issues were that the sleep disorder breathing children had an increased risk of ADD, ADHD by 50%. And that sleep disorder breathing kids were 40 to 100% more likely to have neural behavioral issues. The issue was that at the 40%, the mild category to the 100, the severe category, that was the rate at which you would have neural behavioral issues. In other words, if you were, say, a, a light or a infrequent mouth breather, you had 40% likelihood of having neural behavioral issues. Whereas if you were on the full end of the spectrum where there was a snoring or sleep apnea condition for a child, there would be a 100% rate of neural behavioral issues for those kids. Using this information, we started to recognize that there may be an opportunity to help children to grow and develop a little bit earlier, and that the sooner we could get a child to maybe breathe through the nose and have a tongue that's a little stronger and develop a tongue that hits in the roof of the mouth or lives in the roof of the mouth, we could probably use the musculature of the jaw to regain some of the bone growth, and maybe it would help them breathe a little better, possibly sleep a little better. So our appliance system has been used on children for really about 50 to 60 years. Uh, removable guidance appliances are not new to dentistry. They've been around for a very long time. We've just taken that and really kind of honed it into a, a perfect system. And this system is used on children from 3 on all the way to 12. And what it helps the child do is to grow and develop on a better trajectory than where they are. And we recognize the malocclusion early. Rather than waiting for the child to be 12 and 13 and unraveling it with braces at a later age, we have an opportunity to get involved a little bit earlier and help a child to kind of grow and get closer to where they belong and quite possibly be a little better breather and sleeper. Now waking in the middle of the night is a big struggle for some parents. If you've got a little boy Luke who's about four and a half turning five and he's waking every night, that's, that's a big trouble for the parents. We would recognize that if he's waking at least once a night, uh, the parents are not rested either and that could be an interesting dynamic for you know, how healthy is that whole household. But we recognize this bite as being deep and we also recognize a little lower crowding when we see it. And while he has the first two teeth erupting, he doesn't have any room for the first two, let alone the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth. So we would expect that uh, Luke would have a deep bite with a lot of crowding as he ages. But at four and a half or five years old, we have an opportunity to intervene. Our appliances are delivered as soft, comfortable, removal appliances that can be worn for an hour in the evening and overnight. When Luke returns eight weeks later, the significance is in the deep bite and the significance is in the unraveling of the crowding. The first night for Luke's appliance, it did fall out. He wasn't able to wear it through the whole night on the first night. But every night past that, during the eight weeks, it stayed in for the entire night. And the interesting thing is, when our removable appliance stays in during the night, it, it really does promote the nose breathing. So being a nose breather for those eight weeks, aside from the first night when it fell out, produced a sleeper. And what happened for Luke was, he slept through the entire night. So when Luke returned eight weeks later, his parents were thrilled to report that everyone in the house had been sleeping through the night for the last eight weeks aside from the very first night. Eight weeks later, we can recognize there's a difference in his illusion. It's normal and on track. The crowding is gone. The first two teeth are already aligned just by using a small, comfortable, removable appliance for one hour in the evening plus overnight. The bigger part of the process is getting a good night's sleep will change the behavior of the child during the day. Mouth breathing is fairly common. The more we ask parents to observe their children overnight, the more we recognize that they'll report, uh, whether it's hours and or the whole evening, somewhere between an hour or to the whole evening, a child might have their mouth open and be mouth breathing throughout the night. Uh, Julian is one such child. When we met Julian, he was six years old, and right away when we recognized the malocclusion in his mouth, we started asking questions. And some of our questions are geared towards, you know, how does your child sleep? Are they restless? Do they wake at night? Are they snoring? Are they mouth breathing? 
If you slept with your child, would you recognize that their mouth is open and that air is going in and out of the mouth? For a lot of parents, when a child just sleeps through the whole night, they feel like that's just a good night's sleep. And Julian, while he does sleep through the whole night, his mouth is open most of the night. And the more we kind of ask the parents to observe, the more we learn that he likes to have his mouth open to breathe all night long. And you could recognize that one of the problems might be the growth and development here from his upper lip to his lower lip to his chin. Without that lower jaw growing forward, his lips are not at rest and closed. When he's resting, his lips are open. His lower lip and upper lip don't meet at rest. So if he lays down to go to sleep, chances are his mouth will be open for the entire night. So when Julian is observed overnight, the parents recognize lots of mouth breathing going on at night. And then we have a failure to grow and develop wider and forward. When we take a look at his mouth, same credentials for a lot of other children. We have a primary set of teeth that has barely any space, and if, if anything, a little bit of crowding. The deep bite with a little overjet in there is reflected in the fact that only one permanent tooth is fitting in that spot, and the second one will be challenged for position. So we are off to the races into our malocclusion world. Crowding, deep bite, class two tendency towards, the, uh, over, uh, towards his overjet will be seen in the, the profile photograph. If we deliver our appliances to Julian and ask him to wear them for an hour in the evening plus overnight, a child who follows the directions and wears these beautifully can have this much of a change in six weeks' time. In six weeks' time, we can start to see the bottom teeth, and some room will be developing in just the first six weeks for that second tooth to come in. All of a sudden, the class two kind of overjet deep bite is fading as that child grows and develops into place. By the time 10 months pass, we now have a spot for every single one of the lower incisors where we had a significant amount of crowding before, but we also have a normal overbite and overjet relationship. We have a class one type of bite. More importantly than that is that we have lower jaw growth and development. What we were lacking in the first photograph was a forward and wider position of the lower jaw. And what we're seeing is really evident in the profile in that in just 10 months time, going from six years old to about seven years old, where Julian first shows up with his cheek and his chin and his neck blending as one structure. This is a blend of one structure, a so-called melting of the face into the neck. Really, our head and neck should be two distinct structures, and what happens here is, with just 10 months of forward growth and development, his eyes will show you a little more alert, not so much of the daytime tiredness, but he'll start to have lip seal at rest. The lower jaw will grow forward, his jawline will be extended, it will become very more apparent, much more apparent that he will have a jawline, and underneath it all, he's a better breather. Because Julian on the left side of the screen will be a mouth breather overnight, but Julian on the right side of the screen will be a nose breather throughout the night. So having the effect in 10 months of getting that jaw to grow forward and downward and to get that lip seal at rest and to have a jawline produced, just the use of the muscles alone and the breathing through the nose can help a child to kind of grow out of their malocclusion. Bedwetting isn't a very common thing to know about in a dental practice. But interestingly enough, the more you start asking the questions, the more you start learning that there are a lot of children, whether they're 3, 4, 5, or all the way to 10, 12, or 14, that still struggle with bedwetting. As it turns out, bedwetting is really a telltale sign of a sleep disorder breathing condition. One of the symptoms of sleep disorder breathing in children is bedwetting. And most bedwetting that we would see in children is from a sleep disorder breathing issue. Very rare is a bedwetting condition from some sort of a syndrome or health concern outside of a sleep disorder breathing pattern. This little boy, Chris, at age 10 came in and a deep bite with a little overjet in there. And again, we put him through our Perfect Start appliances and by the time two months had passed, just eight weeks later, his bite had changed a little bit already. What we started out with here had a little change in eight weeks. The important part was that while he wore his appliance all night long, within the first week, the bedwetting stopped. Now, a chronic bedwetter like Chris was bedwetting at about four to five times a week one week later, while wearing his appliance at night, the bedwetting stopped. And as the months went by, 14 months of our guidance appliance therapy, and he's down to just his last canines coming in and erupting. Chris is now a college student who is happy and healthy, performing very well in college, and at 19 years old, he has uh, no longer the need for his guidance appliance, and he has never had the opportunity to have a set of braces. He has a normal overbite, normal overjet, intercuspation of teeth, a beautiful smile. He could do a little better with his toothbrush, but he sleeps with his lips sealed, his nose does the breathing, he has a beautiful quality of sleep, and his bedwetting stopped one week after beginning our appliance therapy. Attitude or behavioral issues do exist. Some kids come in and are challenging. Uh, we met a little girl named Emma at about 11 years old who was uh, a tough child to say the least. Uh, tough attitude and you know difficult to deal with. 
nice kid. All kids are rock stars. Remember how we roll out the red carpet? We're here to help. But some children, the attitude may very well be related to the lack of sleep or a poor quality of sleep. And until we started to quiz the parents about how well the sleeping was going, whether or not there was mouth breathing or snoring or, you know, God forbid, some apnea, which is very serious, a child who pauses should be referred to a physician for a sleep study right away. Pausing or holding the breath as a child is a very severe condition. None of these children have that issue. We're talking about kids who are mouth breathing, maybe to a little snoring, or a, a so-called visible or audible type of breathing pattern but without pausing. So when we take a look at that profile, similar characteristics in the position of the upper lip, the lower lip, and the chin. And basically the upper lip has a fairly normal position, but the lower lip and the chin are recessed or retruded. And we have, again, the blending of the face and the neck. And that's a, a very good indication that this child has not grown forward enough. So when we take a look in there, we would see the classic example of a deeper bite, which would have a little bit of overjet. So what shows in the profile of the face will show in the mouth a little bit of overjet, more or excessive overjet than we'd like to see. The child does have a, a buckle crossbite in the premolar area, so the premolars on top are a little bit outside the premolars on the bottom. Generally, the lower jaw here is very undeveloped or underdeveloped. And if we gave Emma the opportunity to use a guidance appliance system that could guide her draw growth and development forward and wider and downward, it would also, by the time 16 months passed and she was turning uh, 12 and a quarter uh, or 12 and a third years old, she would have a full resolution of her malocclusion to a normal overbite and overjet that would be characterized by class 1 canine to molar intercuspation. And it really would have a significant impact on her growth and development where we would notice her profile change significantly in that course of time. So this is a child who really delivered a little more effort than we asked for. We were looking for two to three hours of use of our appliance in the evening. So she wore our appliance in the evening after getting home from school. She also wore it to bed. And as she grew forward, she got to distinguish her jawline from her neck. Again, a child shouldn't have a head and neck that are indistinguishable or melting together. They should have a separate head and neck structure. The head and neck are two different structures, and anatomically, they should have a jawline that separates them. So as her lower jaw grows forward and wider and downward, changes her appearance. And in those 16 months, she develops the full size mandible that she should have, all by using exercises, breathing through the nose, working on an appliance actively to deliver guided growth and development. Snoring can be a problem for some children, and Michael was one of them. At nine years old, we met Michael, and he does have a deep bite. That deep bite comes with a little bit of overjet, but he goes to sleep, and within minutes of falling asleep, he's already snoring, and he snores pretty loud. Uh, his parents will report that most nights his snoring could wake them up. Michael's profile will show an upper lip, a lower lip, and a chin that are kind of recessed each time we step back here, and as his neck begins to pop out a little bit, we start recognizing a little bit of a ramp in the neck. His cheek and his neck are blending, and that's a compensation for him not having an adequate airway to breathe through his nose, so the neck is going to kind of come out here a little bit. The hyoid bone will probably drop in position. And what we'll recognize is that he'll have a compromised airway. If we look inside, we're going to see a narrower chamber than we'd like to see. But Michael would have a, an impossible time breathing through his nose at night, given the size of his airway. We're very interested in helping him to grow forward, because if we don't get this jaw to grow forward, he's not going to have very good options. There's a big difference between his upper jaw and his lower jaw. The size of that lower jaw is so undeveloped, it'll compromise his airway. So the deep bite is there. Maybe it's moderate. The overjet might be a little excessive. But in the end, ultimately, it's what's underneath that really matters. What does this tube look like? Because at the very top, we have width. This is a reasonable width. Well, his maxilla is not the problem. But as soon as we pass through the oropharynx, it gets narrower and narrower. And at the narrowest part, it's really only about a third of the size it should be. Having an airway this small makes it very difficult to breathe through your nose and do it efficiently all night long and exclusively. So this is a child who will breathe through the mouth, but with an airway this narrow, you're going to hear him breathing, and the end result is the snoring. Well, if we gave him a guided appliance to use for one hour a day plus wear to bed at night, it would slowly guide him to be a nose breather again, and it would use his muscles to help guide the tongue into the palate. And as he swallowed properly and postured the tongue properly, his own musculature would basically work his jaw into a larger size in a forward position. And by the time he turned 14, really just using an appliance to wear to sleep all night long, he would turn himself into a nose breather fully. Lips are closed at rest. The jawline is growing and developing a distinct head and neck. And by the time he turned 16 years old, he has a chiseled jaw with a class 1 occlusion, a broad, wide mandible that has a full forward position and a normal overbite and overjet. 
This is what Michael looks like after using a guided appliance overnight for all of those years. He developed a beautiful occlusion, a class one through molar intercuspation, all the while now sleeping while a, being a nose breather produces a perfect quality of sleep and you can see the difference in the airway. What was a fraction of the size once is now three times the size bigger. And the tripling of the airway is very helpful because if you can triple the size of your airway, the volume of air that can pass through is exponentially large thanks to the so-called physics of the airway volume and circumference. So what you have is a nose that can do all of the breathing and pass all that air through this beautiful airway. So what happens to Michael is that he gets an opportunity to use an appliance that will help his breathing and his musculature to gain the growth and development that he should have or that he lacked by having a start that is very common for kids today, a very soft early diet prevents them from growing downward and forward and wide and having the full size airway underneath. A lot of children today have asthma and have growth and development issues. We met Julia, she was about nine years old and we'll start to recognize in the photograph the dry lips are very indicative of a mouth breather. The same lower third under development, the mandible is very small here and not developed enough. The profile will be common with the other children where the upper lip, lower lip, and chin are like this. The lower lip is behind the upper lip, the chin is behind the lower lip. And all of a sudden, this is not enough forward growth for her to be a good nose breather. If the airway is compromised from lack of growth and development, it's very likely when we look in the mouth, we'll see some sort of malocclusion and or crowding of the teeth. And here we have something that we would recognize as being very big teeth. These teeth are 10 millimeter wide central incisors. So while Julia is not on the height and weight growth chart, she's off the bottom of the chart for height and weight, she was blessed with the biggest of tooth size. So it's only a small percentage of the population, one to two percent of our population uh, have 10 millimeter wide central incisors. Not only that, she has very big laterals or full size lateral incisors. She doesn't have any type of a tooth size discrepancy. So while Julia is undersized in height and weight, not on the so-called growth chart for height or weight, she was also blessed with the biggest of teeth. So I wonder what that translates into for someone who's going to be a small human being with the biggest of teeth. I wonder where we're headed there. She certainly has a deeper bite with plenty of malocclusion and crowding in the lower teeth as well, which we'll see shortly. But the upper teeth don't have proper position and neither is there room for the canines that should be coming in shortly. She still has a couple of primary teeth left and at about nine years old, we still have some time to help her. The lower teeth are very crowded. This is not a normal or natural place for these teeth to be. They end up here because something has gone wrong. The something that went wrong was the early soft diet that promoted the mouth breathing, that prevented the muscles from developing the jaw size for these teeth to fit. Had Julia had a slightly different beginning, these teeth may very well be in place. But we have an opportunity to intervene while the child is still growing and developing. So the idea there is Julia went to four different consultations to learn about her options because her mom recognized this isn't normal, maybe we should do something about it earlier than waiting. And Julia was recommended to have uh, a more traditional braces approach with the extraction of four bicuspids. And so in having a short list of options, uh, the mom was doing further consultations just to see if there were any other options. And most of the options turned up as extractions, meaning, oh, there's just no room for all the teeth. And that, that's a common consultation and a common recommendation when there's just not enough room for the teeth. An alternative to that would be to use appliances that a child could wear one hour per day plus overnight. And with one hour a day plus overnight using your own musculature, you could do this in 20 months. This picture is a picture of Julia at about age eight and a half, and here she is at 10. A 10 year old Julia happens to have the entire full form maxilla and mandible with every single tooth where it belongs. What Julia did was wear a guided appliance that we provided her for one hour per day with active use, meaning she put some pressure on it, and she wore it to sleep at night every night. And as the months went by, her jaw and bone growth delivered the teeth in the right, in the right size and position. So what happened to Julia was guidance appliance therapy, one hour per day, plus overnight, and over 20 months she developed this occlusion all by herself. No brackets, no wires, no rubber bands no fixed anything, all removable appliances. As the primary teeth are shed and the premolars come in, they take a much broader position. The palate becomes an imprint of the tongue. As the appliance is being used, Julia is a nose breather. As she is a nose breather and the tongue is in the palate, we would recognize that the lower arch would develop its full width and a beautiful arch form and an arch width translated to teeth that fit together. 
The end result is a lot of airway and facial development. While Julia becomes a nose breather and uses her muscles to grow and develop, what was once a dry lip indicative of that mouth breathing is now a perfectly moist and normal lip and also nose breathing all night long as well as a perfect quality of sleep and you can tell even the difference in the purple shading under the eye is reduced or diminished. The facial features are all proportionate for Julia. The interesting thing is that over the course of treatment she grew 4 inches and 18 pounds in just the year and a half. Growing 4 inches and 18 pounds put her on the growth chart. Not to mention the fact that in the first six months of her growth and development, when she switched over to being a nose breather again, her asthma completely resolved. She went from using an inhaler to actually being fitted last week for a sports guard so she could play field hockey. Previously, she couldn't run from here to there without using her inhaler. These two children are vastly different. On the left side of the screen is an unhealthy Julia. On the right side of the screen is what Julia looks like when she's healthy. This is a Julia that has had an appropriate growth and development opportunity and it shows in her profile. When she gets to use those muscles and breathing to grow downward and forward and all her teeth land where they belong, she gets the proper jaw structure, she gets the proper jaw line, she gets the proper head and neck, she gets the proper breathing through the nose. And what it ends up being is a beautiful full smile. And so there's nothing wrong with Julia having big teeth. Having a 10 millimeter central incisor doesn't matter. Whether or not she's going to be 4 foot 11 or 5 foot 2 makes no difference. Julia is entitled to have all of her teeth where they belong so that she can have a full and beautiful healthy set of 28 teeth in place and will reevaluate where she is at 18 for her wisdom teeth. But having all of the facial proportions show up to hold all the teeth is the most beautiful Julia that is possible. Extracting the four bicuspids doesn't allow for the full entire growth and development of the child. It's a different opportunity. And we chose this opportunity since Julia and her mom were eager to give this a chance. We now know what these appliances can perform in a matter of just months. So the idea behind being happy and healthy and having a beautiful occlusion and having all of your teeth in place, it's all about the musculature. It's all about the breathing. And underneath those crowded teeth in that malocclusion that we're so focused on as dentists, there's a bigger issue. It's the breathing. And the breathing of the child, the breathing through the nose, for a child to be a nose breather all night long is really paramount. And in the dental world, we have a small opportunity to help a child to grow and develop a little bit better to make a better breather, which could translate into a better sleeper. And so I hope this webinar opens the doors and opens the opportunity for people to recognize that there are a lot of children in your practices that you're looking at that have, let's say, the crowded teeth and have the malocclusion. And really what they have underlying that is the underdeveloped maxilla and mandible. And underlying the underdeveloped maxilla and mandible is the airway that's compromised and very likely a child that is breathing through their mouth more than they should be. And a small amount of mouth breathing in a 24-hour period is all it takes to make a child become unhealthy. So the end result is to have a beautiful and full and wide developed smile requires the use of the breathing and the musculature, not just appliances that kind of force or push things. When you're using a soft guided appliance that the Perfect Start system is built on, we can offer results to uh, Julia's of the world where no longer does she need an inhaler. She doesn't have to be confined to an inhaler or her asthma. She can now run and play field hockey with the rest of her friends. The end result is that it is all about the airway. The reason Julia is allowed to run, and she can run like a deer now, is because she has a massive airway. When a child uses our appliances according to the prescriptions that we provide, they have this opportunity to develop a broad and wide, and this is like a super highway in here, she could park a truck in this airway. And if you could park a truck in your airway, well, you'll have a beautiful class one occlusion, but you'll also have it forward. And you can tell by her profile and facial features that not only has she developed her full class one in a forward and broad and wide position, underneath it would be reflective of an excellent breather. And an excellent breather a nose breathing child most of the day and night doesn't need an inhaler anymore. I thank you very much for your time and again it's, a, it's an introduction. I'm going to turn things back over to Dr. Cartinson to do a wrap up with an opportunity for you to maybe learn a little more about the Perfect Start system. Hey Dr. Morelli, I have a question for you because something really jumped off the screen. What, Michael, the young uh, boy you were talking about, when you showed that Seth that was a before and after Seth, I was noticing his uh, his posture, his uh, his uh, cervical alignment 
really yes. made a big difference in that. Yes, that's very common. In, in the short time frame that we have to produce this webinar, there are so many things that are left out, but one of them is posture. And what happens is, once you obstruct the nose, or you become some sort of a mouth breather, and there is research done on this, uh, it only takes about 90 minutes for the cervical vertebrae to alter in posture. Basically, it's more of a lean forward or a bend or a curve. It's really what the body is doing is trying to optimize the position to get the best airway possible, given the fact that it's compromised. And the studies show if you plug the nose of a human being, within 90 minutes, the body will alter its posture to be a better breather, even though it is through the mouth. It's the best breather you can be. So we cover that in a lot more detail when we have more, more time. But posture is a huge issue because posture can throw a whole number of things off the mark for a child when all of a sudden their head is sitting forward and their shoulders are in the wrong place. It, it does throw a number of things out for them. Boy, of course, we sure see that in our adult patients in practices like mine. So, so what you're starting is, is going to be reflected later on in that. So let's look at some other things that we can do to uh, find out more about uh, the things that you've opened the door to. I, I really like this presentation. I really thank you for all that you brought to this. And it just makes me excited to be curious about that. So let me show you some things that uh, Perfect Start has put together so that we can get this message out to the people that enjoyed this video and would love to see more. So uh, Perfect Start puts on some clinical training events. So back here, we have some ways that we can learn more about how we can change lives in our patient population. Imagine what those kids, what those families are like. And you can't do that for those kids without changing your own life. And so we all know that as dentists, that we get a chance to make a big difference in people's lives. And it's nothing like helping kids out and knowing that they're going to turn into better adults because of what we can do. So what Perfect Start does is we have two full days of training with Dr. Moralia plus some hands-on clinical training with live patients. So you are you get to have your whole staff there, you get accredited training, and how does that take place? You have a live patient day. So that day there's demonstration patients. You have experienced clinicians showing what happens, talking to parents, bringing kids in, diagnosing, uh, discussing the possibilities, and all those things while you get a chance to observe that. So not just a lecture like you just saw, not even just a longer lecture of all answering a lot more questions like Dr. Moralia talked about, but actual hands-on, things that you can see going on so you can imagine how it can work for you. And if you bring your staff, you guys can huddle up and you can say, okay, now what works in our office? How can we make this work? It's a, an amazing event. Now, if you're local enough to the live patient events, you can bring in your own patients. And on Saturday, you get to have your patients there in live uh, situations with, with experts over your shoulders talking to you about how you can help that family that you have your mind on right now probably about those kids being able to help. So it's a wonderful event that, that, uh, the, that Perfect Start puts on. If you're excited about this, if you're excited about the chance of helping kids like you just saw and turning those kids from mouth breathers, from sick kids, from kids off the chart of growth and developing the normal kids, normal healthy kids, then come to one of these clinical training events. Because you watch this webinar, Dental Sleep Practice Magazine has made a special deal, and we have uh, normal tuition is, is 30, sorry, $3,500. When you have <clears throat> this, uh, when you watch this webinar, you can get $500 off that using a special code. So it's a really a good investment at any price, I think, but with $500 off, isn't that better? So if you call Perfect Start right now, we're going to go to their website, register for one of these close by uh, events, clinical training events. You are going to start making a difference, just like you saw in those kids. And, and I, I think it's going to be a fantastic thing. So thank you for your time here. I really appreciate you being here. I'm, I'm thankful for Perfect Start for putting this together. I'm thankful for Dental Sleep Practice Magazine for helping make this happen for all of us. And so, so there we go. I, I, I love this. And thanks a lot for being here with us today. This is Steve Carstensen. I'm Editor-in-Chief of Dental Sleep Practice Magazine. I hope that you enjoy the magazine. I hope you enjoy Perfect Start. And I really hope you enjoy helping your patients get healthier for their entire lives. Wow, what a thing. So to close this presentation, I want you to watch this video. This video has some actual patients on it, has some doctors, has some things that you can see. You can imagine your own practice making a difference like these people felt after using Perfect Start System. So watch the video, look at the 
uh, dates possible. Go to Perfect Start, sign up, start making a difference right now. I'm Amanda Juarez. I practice in Houston, Texas. I have a, a private practice there. I have one associate. I went to training in April with Dr. Moralia and came back and started the program right away. At the event, I brought some of my staff with me and it was incredible. I was in shock and awe, I guess would be the best way to say, like just of the impact this could have on kids as a whole. I actually went because of a personal reason, because I had three boys who have sleep apnea and I was looking for any other way that I could possibly help them. But when I got there, I realized the impact this could have on so many of the kids in my practice and in my community. So we just were just blown away by what we heard and saw. Biggest reward for me so far for Perfect Start is seeing the changes in my own kids. Um, life changing for my husband and I, I could be really emotional about it, but um, uh, my oldest son, so we, I mean, visually photos, you can see big changes in the teeth. But for me, my six year old had never slept through the night ever since birth. So two nights after wearing it all night, slept through the night. And I actually freaked out a little bit, had to go check on him because I thought something's wrong. And then I have twins that are five and they, same thing, like as soon as they were wearing the appliance all night, it was like we were alone in our bedroom for the first time ever. And I really thought it was always bad parenting skills. I just, we were too tired. We have three little boys and just not putting them back to bed. But when I realized the impact it had on their sleep and then even on their behavior because they're sleeping so well, um, I mean, I just can't even tell enough people about it. Like that really has been the biggest thing. And my boys recognize it. When I came back from the training, I actually, the next day, called and had my associate sign up to go for training. I think that every dentist should provide this in their practice. I don't even see kids in my practice. That was actually the biggest thing. I came back and told my staff, we're going to start offering this service. And they were like, how are we going to see children? Um, I said, it doesn't matter. We have parents and grandparents, so we're going to see kids. This is going to happen. And so I think any dentist should have this in their practice, provide it, tell their patients about it. Um, and just become certified to be able to do Perfect Start. It's of course an income you know, generator too, but really more than anything else, it's just getting help for these kids that parents don't even realize the underlying cause of some of the things their children are experiencing. And for me, it's just more of a mission, like to get it out there and help these kids. But I think every dentist should, should do the same. So many places, the things that I did, there was every broken bone. I swear I lived